Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Razanan. Let me share my screen. In Asia's Anthropocene, Asia's marine spaces have no narrative. The Anthropocene Epoch refers to the growing human impact on biogeophysical processes of planetary scale, such as human-caused climate change, and now usually is associated with the Great Acceleration since the mid-20th century as its first stage. Incidentally, during this time period, in Asia, decolonizing after World War II and engaging in economic development, the industrialization of a part of the world ocean synchronized with the continent's terrestrial, crude oil-driven national development projects. What can be called the first wave of humanities and social science publications on the Anthropocene largely shifted responsibility for climate change and other planetary problems to a small group of Euro-American elites. These elites, centuries ago, set in motion the capitalist economic system that the authors associate with New World plantation economies and exploitative regimes. Similarly, the industrial revolution's shift in modes of production was associated with the intention of industrialists to reduce dependence on unruly labor, then giving birth to large-scale mechanization and the so-called age of coal. Such claims and the additional zines, the capitalocene, the plantationocene and so on, that the authors came up with, helped to spur research into the origins of Asia's Anthropocene. In view of the deficits of these claims, ranging from hardly considering the ecological disasters caused by the plant economies of communist ruled countries and a selective actor focus on a capitalist elite instead of consumers to a bias toward dynamics in Europe and the Americas. More recent studies began to locate Asia's place in the trajectory of the Anthropocene. A major contribution was Amitav Ghosh's The Great Derangement, which drew attention to the missing narrative of climate change in Asian studies. My talk also addresses this deficit by emphasizing that Asia's marine spaces still lack such a narrative. I propose to create one by focusing on the sudden synchronicity of terrestrial and oceanic transitions to oil economies as a defining moment in the emergence of Asia's Anthropocene. My paper argues that Asian political elites and their development agendas were the guiding forces in appropriating Asian marine spaces and exploiting offshore oil fields during post-World War II decolonization. Neither a small group of Western or transnational corporate capitalists nor choice limitations due to the legacy of Western colonial structures. This is a strong contrast to the claims promoted by aforementioned capitalocene, plantationocene and so on studies, many of which have a strong Western bias and universalized phenomena that played at best a subordinate role in Asia's offshore hydrocarbon fuel extraction. For the first time in oceanic history, Offshore oil fields created a huge amount of ghost acres in previously fuel empty marine spaces. Although some Asian marine spaces had, I should add, seen a temporary killing rush for whale oil, a kind of biofuel, in the 19th century. The appropriation of marine spaces that harbored Asia's offshore fields therefore provided an important oceanic substitute for an otherwise higher demand for various kinds of terrestrial fuel sources depending on where countries and markets were situated in the energy transition between biomass, coal and oil. Around the end of the period investigated here, in 1975, the offshore oil share in total production strongly differed between Asian countries, but in many cases had become very substantial. For example, Indonesia produced about 64 million metric tons of oil on land and about 12 million tons offshore. Malaysia about 5 million on land and 4 million offshore, and Bonai 9.5 million on land and 7 million offshore. When discussing the materiality of Asia's ocean and its offshore oil fields, the main reason that enabled the offshore energy transition was the liquidity of oil, concentrating itself by flowing or by being pressured toward an extraction point drilled from above the aquatic surface into the seabed. 
In contrast, until today, the physical properties of aquatic spaces do not enable an economically feasible extraction of coal, being solid and therefore too immobile to be easily pumped upward. The ocean therefore never saw an energy transition to coal. Likewise, the physical properties of aquatic spaces meant that offshore geographies were accessible due to the limited need for infrastructure construction compared to land, since drilling equipment and later the oil could be transported on barges and ships. It is possible to claim that Japan was the first country in which offshore oil drilling took place in case operations in the Caspian Sea and in US lakes are left out. In the early 1880s, by chance, an oil seepage was spotted in the Sea of Japan, 40 to 50 meters off the coastal town of Amase in Niigata Prefecture, central west Honshu. The geographical contingency of Japan's offshore oil fields, combined with the physical geography of its coastal territory, turned into a major reason why offshore oil drilling only after World War II was strongly pushed by Japanese political elites. There was no continuous stretch of fields from very shallow standing waters to deeper open waters, as it was the case in the United States Mississippi Delta, where such conditions constantly advanced offshore oil technology. Considering the growing Japanese oil demand during the imperial period, meaning that a local market existed. Without such a contingency, the, the divergence between the ability of Japanese and US experts to exploit offshore oil fields could have been smaller and the energy transition in Asia's waters been pushed earlier by Japanese political elites. My point is that in the very late 19th century, when offshore oil drilling had emerged in both Honshu and Southern California, a related Trans-Pacific technology transfer facilitated facilitated the Japanese offshore oil expansion. However, afterwards, the geographical contingencies inhibited it. In 1894, oil drilling began along Summerland's Beach, a coastal county in Southern California, located near Santa Barbara. In spring 1898, Southern Pacific Railroad built a first wooden pier reaching at low tide, about seven to eight meter into Pacific waters on which derricks were set up, as you can see here. In 1902, more than 100 offshore wells were in operation in Summerland. This offshore advance of several US companies resulted in experiments to adapt drilling and production technology to marine conditions. Back at Amase Beach, between 1898 and 1900, secure access to the offshore drill sites was improved by changing small paths of reclaimed land to the use of summer land-like wooden piers that you can see here. The offshore oilscapes created by private oil companies in Niigata Prefecture in Southern California therefore were not very different. During the first half of the 20th century, offshore oil drilling increasingly diverged between Japan and those regions with different geographical conditions that encouraged a continuous technological adaptation to increasingly rougher waters. The difference was the shallow standing waters and tidal marshes of Louisiana's bayous that, during a decades-long southern expansion of aquatic drilling, in 1938 led to exploration in the shallow waters of the Gulf of Mexico. The critical point is that even though because of technology advances, the geographical differences now began to matter much less. Japanese political elites lost access to such technology during the late 1930s and the Pacific War. Oil by then had exploded in importance for Japanese political elites, considering that ultimately the US, Dutch, British oil embargo was the Japanese government's main reason to conquer the Indonesian oil wells and to go to war with the United States and the Dutch government in exile. Knowledge in Japan about US offshore oil technology certainly was given. Related to the struggle between the federal government and several US states about legal control over offshore oil fields, in March 1939, US Representative Sam Hobbs criticized in Congress that, I quote, the vast bulk of the oil now being extracted from California's offshore wells is being sold to Japan, and Japan has as much right to buy as any other purchaser, 
but we need that oil for US Navy Reserve, end of quotation. Without question, the origin of that oil was known in Japan, where at least some of it powered the war in China. When World War II was over, the attempts of Japanese oil experts to slightly improve the empire's increasingly desperate oil situation through offshore drilling had resulted in nothing. For example, in occupied French Indochina, wrong data interpretations resulted in a lagoon drilling project where no oil field was located. Another example was British Burma, where Burma oil companies and Indo-Burma petroleum companies' oil wells were destroyed and therefore denied to the invading Japanese military. The vast majority of Burma's contemporary oil fields were located along the banks of the Irrawaddy River. This oil field geography again emphasized how important the contingency of location was, which for economically feasible production, in face of the absence of a local market, needed waterways for transportation before such transportation of equipment and oil through roads, railways, or early pipelines became available. At the Laniva and Chalk fields in Upper Burma, Indo-Burma Petroleum in 1925 and 1926 had walled off part of the river's west bank through a land reclamation project. Afterwards, the company used technology developed in the United States watery regions. Derricks were set up on piers designed to enable drilling in slow-moving waters shielded by the wall. During the occupation, the Japanese managed to produce a very limited amount of oil at the fields, but one has to assume that lack of technology, resources and knowledge meant that they tapped the least damaged and almost accessible terrestrial wells. Altogether, geographical contingencies, the global trajectory of offshore oil technology advances and dwindling, dwindling access to such technology meant that after Japanese oil companies had set Asia's first offshore oil project into motion near the end of the 19th century, Japanese political elites for decades played no role in moving Asia's waters into the Anthropocene. Rather, agency rested with several private Western oil companies operating in the colonial frameworks that shaped Burma and other places that I cannot cover here in detail. This contrast is important to understand the radical shift toward Asian political elites agency when decolonization and Japan's post-war international rehabilitation allowed it. In December 1955, the Japanese government founded a semi-public company tasked with exploring and developing new fields, the Japan Petroleum Exploration Company, JPEX. One of JPEX's main concerns was to import technology. This concern also illustrates that several governments of Asian countries eventually turned offshore oil exploration, platform construction, maintenance and technology development into parts of their national development plans. Governmental appropriations of marine spaces and state-supported exploration projects since the mid-1950s show that Asian political elites now began to guide the, the succeeding wave of offshore hydrocarbon fuel development projects. Whether private or public companies engaged in production, the agency was shaped by the spatial appropriation and the legal regimes created by Asian political elites. I emphasize this point of state-led offshore hydrocarbon developmentalism by contrasting the marine space appropriation after decolonization to the earlier projects. Aforementioned earlier offshore drilling since the late 19th century had taken place within the already claimed territorial waters of Japan or in rivers and swamps of European colonies. What now emerged was a state-led large-scale marine space appropriation that stretched from West Asia's Persian Gulf to the East China Sea and further north. To begin the task of importing offshore oil technology, JPEX purchased a jackup rig design, which had been developed for use in the Gulf of Mexico. The newly constructed offshore platform began its exploration work of Akita Prefecture, northwest Honshu, in April 1959. In November, it discovered a first offshore field located off Michikawa, 
very close to Akita city. Japanese offshore oil fields had a marginal size compared to those found in major oil regions. But an almost simultaneous government-supported project found a huge field and accelerated the energy transition in the waters of West Asia's Persian Gulf. A discovery by a US oil company attracted the attention of Japanese political and economic elites, among them businessman Yamashita Taro. Yamashita was a well-known businessman with very good contacts to Prime Minister Kishi Nobusuke's cabinet. After long negotiations between February 1957 and July 1958, Yamashita's newly founded Arabian oil company gained a concession in the waters of the Saudi Arabia Kuwait neutral zone. The Japanese government provided diplomatic support and large amounts of capital. In 1966, the company's offshore field, discovered in 1960, contributed a very noteworthy 14% to Japan's oil imports. In terms of the growing agency of Asian political elites, the Saudi Arabian and Kuwaiti governments were able to receive substantially better conditions from Yamashita than Western oil companies had previously offered them. Moreover, first the negotiations and later the discovery encouraged them and other Asian governments to appropriate marine spaces beyond their territorial waters by proclaiming legal control over the continental shelf and its oil resources. Such claims internationally accelerated in the 1950s, also in reaction to the US government's claim over continental shelf resources in 1945, the so-called Truman Proclamation, and culminated in the United Nations Convention on the Continental Shelf of 1958, through which governments granted each other legal control over offshore oil exploitation wherever technology could reach it. In Japan's case, while the agency of capitalists like Yamashita is not denied at all, the framework of support from Japanese diplomats and governmental funding was highly important. The rapidly growing oil requirements of the high growth economy and memories of the oil embargo of summer 1941 strongly increased energy security fears. These oil demands and fears emphasized that Japanese political elites, as well as Saudi and Kuwaiti ones, created the framework within which Arabian oil had to operate. The offshore focus of Asian political elites meant that Asia's terrestrial and oceanic energy transitions toward oil synchronized, gradually moving Asia's ocean into the fossil fuel economy that defined the Anthropocene. In post-war Indonesia, the political agenda to decolonize the oil industry prevented, until 1960, the creation of any new concessions. Several years later, the political elites of the new Suharto regime saw offshore oil concessions as an efficient way to increase tax revenues and reduce the rapid inflation. Ibn Sutowo, the head of national oil company Pemina, in 1968 merging into Petamina, who in 1966 became Minister of Mines in the Suharto cabinet, then encouraged the involvement of foreign oil companies through production sharing agreements between them and Petamina. The result was that marine regions from North Sumatra to East Borneo were turned into concessions and experienced an exploration rush. The creation of the Committee for Coordination of Joint Prospecting for Mineral Resources in Asian Offshore Areas CCRP, illustrates the importance of offshore oil in the context of Asia's international, meaning intergovernmental, development projects. Some of the long-term results of CCOP's first survey project are very well known internationally, being the world's most notorious maritime boundaries conflicts. What now follows is the strongest example of Asian political elites claiming control over offshore oil exploration and production and denying them to each other, whereas economic considerations or the prospects of corporate capitalists did not matter much. The doubtless most important sentence in the survey report, published in 1969, reads the following. I quote, A high probability exists that the East China Sea's continental shelf between Taiwan and Japan may be one of the most prolific oil reservoirs in the world. End of quotation. 
A couple of sentences later, readers learned about the lower but still substantial economic potential of the Yellow Sea. A second favorable area for oil and gas is beneath the Yellow Sea, where three broad basins are present. In the case of the East China Sea, the survey was the main reason for the emergence of the Senkaku Jiaoyu Islands conflict between the governments of Japan, Taiwan and China, festering until today, since control over these islands would define legal control over the surrounding seabed, including some of the hoped for oil fields. And similar things can also be said about the conflicts in the South China Sea. Altogether, the Asian Anthropocene cannot be understood adequately without consideration of intensifying offshore oil production, meaning the point in time when Asia's terrestrial and oceanic energy transitions towards oil began to synchronize in this new epoch of climate change and other problems. But what does the strong agency of political elites tell us about the future of the ocean in the Asian Anthropocene? After terrestrial and oceanic energy transitions synchronized, there is no reason to assume that they will desynchronize again. In the new energy transition toward renewable energy, solar power and, even more dependent on location, wind power are the only realistic alternatives to fossil fuel and nuclear power plants. In the same way that offshore oil created large amounts of oceanic ghost acres, I have little doubt that Asian governments will aim to gain large amounts of ghost acres from renewable energy generation from the ocean to reduce terrestrial demand for solar panel space. To some degree, the contingency of locations, here continuously high wind speeds or strong solar radiation, and the physical geographies of coastal regions again have an impact. Offshore wind turbines can draw on decades of research into floating or fixed platforms. However, in the case of large floating solar panels that need a different type of stabilizing technology, these since 2007 have been installed in numerous Asian lakes. Such relatively calm lake waters are reminiscent of the role that Louisiana's bayous played in the history of offshore oil. In the bayous, the technology continuously advanced and in the end led to rough open waters. In the case of floating solar, such open waters on average would allow a slightly higher energy generation than terrestrial places. In that sense, future and more detailed narratives concerning the ocean in Asia's Anthropocene would have to critically reflect about the various governmental activities that have shaped and may continue to shape Asia's offshore advance. This includes governmental failures, corruption, disastrous incentive systems and their reasons. Just to give one example, the huge number of Japanese government-financed unsuccessful offshore oil test drilling projects resulted in failure rates of 97 to 98 percent, causing serious moral hazard and immense taxpayer costs as a result of the very problematic incentive regime that originated in the energy security fears of Japanese political elites. We certainly do not need similar disasters in the current energy transition when we talk about determining appropriate places for offshore wind parks or floating solar arrays and making sure that no serious conflicts with other offshore industries such as fishing, tourism, mariculture and so on arise. Thank you.